Welcome to Non-Toxic. I'm Daniel Penny. And I'm Andrew Lewis. Before we start the show today, we wanted to take a moment to thank the people who have listened to season one of Non-Toxic and supported us. If you've been watching the world burn this summer and have been getting something out of the thought-provoking conversations on Non-Toxic, and you haven't yet signed up to be a patron, now is the time. Dan and I have been doing this essentially on our own steam but we can't do it alone. If you want to help make Non-Toxic Season 2 a reality, head over to patreon.com slash non-toxic podcast and sign up today. If you'd like to wear your support of the show, we've just released a limited edition batch of Non-Toxic t-shirts in collaboration with sustainable denim brand Amendi. If you'd like to order one, there's going to be a link in the show notes. Okay, now to the matter at hand. We're talking about death. Daniel, tell me about our guest for the final episode of season one, Bob Hendricks. He's a Dutch inventor. He sounds pretty eccentric. Yes. Bob is an architect and bio designer. He's the founder of a company called Loop, which is based in the Netherlands. And they make coffins out of mycelium. Mycelium meaning mushrooms? Exactly. They're called living coffins because they decompose the human body in a matter of weeks rather than years, returning the nutrients to the earth and capturing carbon. I reached out to him because I wanted to end season one with a reflection on how we choose to die and the way our deaths can either restore the earth or continue to destroy it. It's the final choice any of us can make, and I think that in a way it carries a lot more weight, at least symbolically. Bob has a saying. You can either be waste or compost. Which would you prefer? I love that line. It's amazing to kind of reflect on we humans, our capacity to destroy nature for centuries. And in that time, that that destruction has extended beyond the grave. It's ridiculous. How many toxic coffins have we put into the earth, you know, and for what? I'm excited to hear about Bob's journey, so let's get going. Here's Daniel talking with Bob Hendricks, founder of Loop and inventor of The Living Coffin. Bob Hendricks, welcome to Non-Toxic. Thanks so for having me, Daniel. You've been doing research for a few years on designing spaces and objects that are made from living organisms. What led you to that design approach? Yeah, that's a really good question. So actually, I grew up in the city of Eindhoven, which is where Philips invented the light bulb. And they had like a whole village where all their employees worked. And for me as a kid, it was like insane. Like, how can a company of of one person, like, think of some innovation that becomes so big that they are going to build like villages for their workers? So I grew up in there. We lived in the city, but we always went on holiday to like hiking in Austria. So I grew up with a lot of yeah, nature, a lot of nature fascination of going to the beaches and searching for fossils of sharks, that kind of stuff. Um, so then I went to the University of Delft Technology to study architecture because I thought like, hey, I want to yeah, reshape the world we live in, create sustainable housing. And that, that sort of was really nice. But what I learned is that there was a lot of focus on being less bad instead of being good. So it was like minimizing the negative impact instead of focusing on, hey, how can we actually add value? So I felt like, okay, during my graduation, I want to do something totally different and really build like nature, like how birds make their nest, how bees are like the architectural wizards, how they make their nest and really study that and look at natural structures. So my professor's like, okay, cool topic, but super abstract. We're a technical university. You need to graduate our real house. So I said, okay, I'll do a living home. And then I went like on this little David Edinburgh mon mode that went on and just like, okay, I'm an architect, but I'm just going to study nature. Look at all the stuff they create. I made like a list of like, it's just an Excel sheet. Like it needs to be scalable. It needs to be everywhere in the world and like all these parameters. And then at some point, mycelium stumbled pretty high on the list because it's, yeah, it's a common organism and actually the fruiting body gets really hard. Let's maybe pause there. What is mycelium? Yeah, that's a really good question. So mycelium is the root structure of 
mushrooms, and they're known to be vital to the forest floor as they have a very important function because they recycle dead organic matter into fresh plant fruit. So basically they're yeah, making sure the cycle of life continues and death becomes new life. So this is where I think it becomes interesting because my whole point was trying to have a positive footprint. But during this, I noticed that me as a human being, as a designer, still my ego was very big and I am Bob and I wanted to build something. So I made sure with mycelium, we're going to build a home. And later on, I pivoted from that moment because I had this experience in the lab in which at some point I was actually growing the organism in molds. How do you grow it in the lab? So what do we do? You have a pure piece of mycelium and you mix it with a, yeah, with a source of organic material that can be wood chips, that can be old clothing, that can be leaves, that can be whatever. And the mycelium will eat it. So if you put them together in a mold, in our instance, for example, for seven days, will grow and eat all this organic material and thereby binding everything together, sort of like gluing everything together. And if you then just demold it, you have like this big sort of mushroom-like material that's really soft and squeaky. And then if you put it, for example, in the oven, you kill the organism and you have like a super strong material. And for me, this was exactly the pivotal moment because I was like, hey, I'm killing the organism. And I sort of made this deal with myself that I was not going to be, yeah, super bent. So what is happening here? And that was for me the pivotal moment that I really went deep into mycelium because I knew, okay, what does, what does humanity want? What does Bob want? Bob wants to build freaking homes for the population to come. But what does mycelium want? What does a mushroom want? And then I went into like, okay, what is it, the function, the role in ecology? And then I learned, hey, it's the recycler. It really wants to be in the soil. And actually it's really hurting a lot because there's a lot of non-fertile soil, very poor soil quality due to the lack of mycelium. So I was like, oh my God, this is a crazy idea. So I had like a, at the Dutch design week, I had like a mock-up of my living home and a woman came to me and said like, hey, what happens if my mom would die in your home? And I was like elaborating, oh, that would be super interesting because she will be recycled into new plant food and all her nutrients will allow the new generation of forest to flourish. For me, it was that moment like, oh my God, this should be at least something to do with the dead care industry. And I think it should be a coffin. And that was sort of my graduation moment. I was like, a coffin, Bob, you, you can't do that. You can't grow a coffin because it felt scary to go into like the funeral industry. But luckily I dared and now, now we're here. This was kind of serendipitous. It sounds like you had these visions of being an architect, perhaps like building whole villages of mycelium. And instead from this conversation, you now are in the business of making mycelium coffins. Exactly. How exactly does the mycelium coffin decompose a human body. Maybe we should explain that just because like, I understand the basics of decomposition, right? You go in the earth, theoretically worms and other bacteria and other little insects and critters start eating your body. They digest it, but that can take a very, very long time if you're buried in a casket. Yeah. So what happens is, for example, when a coffin goes into the soil, Within 45 days, like in the ideal soil conditions, the organism has eaten like the coffin itself and thereby making sure the whole body is exposed to the natural environment. And the natural environment is enriched by the mycelium. So it's sort of that, like mycelia hosts a lot of bacteria that could help decomposing us. So it's sort of like, hey, you put our body into the most fresh amount of soil put it in the soil, the mycelium's like, hey guys, we got a party over here, everybody join in. Mycelium eats itself and it sort of hosts or accelerates the decomposition of the body, which goes from the external world, like from the current ecosystem, like that helps to decompose the body. But on the other side, also our gut bacteria will also eat us ourselves up from the inside. So we also already decompose, of course. That's fascinating because I know that there's all this emerging research into the gut biome and 
the symbiotic relationship between humans and their gut bacteria, but I hadn't realized that the gut bacteria at the end of our lives end up helping they're, they're going to it makes us. sense it yeah. makes sense it's yeah. like you know when people have cats and they die in their house and then the cats eventually eat them i right. guess it's kind of similar so one of the things that i found kind of disturbing when i was reading your re research isn't just the isn't the idea of being eaten by a mycelium coffin but rather that there are actually a lot of toxins that human bodies release through the process of decomposition, what kind of chemicals are we talking about and how exactly are they getting into our bodies and then from our bodies into the environment through that decomposition process? Yeah, so that that's a pretty big problem, I would say. So what we're doing like on a worldwide scale is polluting the environment and we grow our food in that environment. So for example, fish in the ocean, vegetables from the land. We pollute the land, we pollute the ocean, we eat the vegetable or the fish. It ends up in our body eventually. So there's a lot of research showing like, hey, we're getting microplastics. We're getting heavy metals in our bodies. And in the end, we put that big casket, which is most of the times a lot of material depletion, like a lot of glue and that kind of toxin stuff on it. And then we put that as a total package, like, hey, earth, thank you. We put it in the ground and good luck with decomposing it. Yeah, so that, that's not per se super good. So there, there are multiple researches showing like, hey, there's a lot of toxins in the human body. And if the soil is healthy, I would, I can argue like, hey, the soil will get there. But when we do it on a, such a big scale as we're currently doing, then I believe it will become a problem. And especially is this what we want to teach the next generation? Like, hey, this is how you're making use of the earth. I don't think so. Um, so in the end, stuff ha yeah, occurs in our, in our body, ends up in the soil. And the cool thing about mycelium is actually that certain species have different proper properties to, for example, eat microplastics or neutralize heavy metals. Um, so actually, there's a cool research in Chernobyl, how they used mushroom mycelia to make sure to get the toxins out of the earth, put it into the mushroom, and thereby sort of cleaning the land. Uh, we're working with a species that is also able to neutralize heavy toxins. For example, like, for example, in harbor situations, it's common into the soil. And so our big vision is like, hey, what if we can buy plots of polluted land and bury people in mushroom coffins, have like a sustainable funeral, but at the same time, reforest or regreen and revitalize a space that is now yeah, left behind. Today's episode of Non-Toxic is sponsored by Fruling, a New York-based snack company making next-level trail mix with heirloom varieties of nuts, berries, and whole-roasted cacao beans. Find Fruling products at select boutiques and health food stores or order directly online. Listeners can use the code NONTOXIC, that's in all caps, for 20% off orders at fruling.co slash shop. Fruling, naturally delicious. What kind of carbon impact does a mycelium coffin have versus a, a normal coffin or a cremation? Like, is this, is there a climate crisis angle to this or is it more about like ecology and soil health? I get what you're saying. Currently we're performing like life cycle analysis to really make the measurements concrete. But what I can say, like mycelium has the ability to store carbon in the soil. So during growth, they absorb carbon and actually we can implement carbon in the organism and store it in the soil. So that's from the perspective of the, the carbon and looking at climate change, of course, one of the parameters is the CO2 and is the carbon emission, uh, but also part of it is like biodiversity and soil health. And that's actually, I think where we play the biggest part. There's a lot of research been shown like, Hey, Mycelia helps to revitalize the soil, brings extra communities of insects, et cetera. But it's harder, of course, to quantify. So there was that, has... that paper that recently came out. Exactly. That discovered that mycelium was responsible for like an insane amount of carbon capture. It, it was 30%. That we had previously, yeah, we'd previously been just unaware of. Yeah, yeah that, that's insane. Yeah. 
So that therefore it has a lot of potential. I think that's, that, that's really interesting. And for us, it's all about like growing, growing a product that if you use it, it has a positive footprint. So if our company grows, it would mean it would be better for nature. And the, the thing I'm facing right now is that on a product level, that is correct, the claim. But if you look at the operations you're doing, the factory you have to run to make it, there you need to go a long way. And now it, it sort of feels like, sometimes I think like the best thing you can do as a human is just go in the forest and just lay there and don't eat anymore and just let your whole body decompose and let everyone of the forest enjoy your body. Because either way, like we live in this world and we're going to have a negative impact. Because we want a lot of stuff, like me, including like, I'm already have the product. Okay. But I want to skill up. I want to do this. I want to do that. So now my challenge is, okay, how can we skill up our production and still have that enriching footprint? What is the, the, the timeline looking like? Like, I know that you know, you're a young company. Loop has only been around for a little while, but you know, what is the path to scaling up look like? How do you go from making, you know, growing individual coffins in kind of a lab setting to making hundreds, thousands? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. We have a vision of turning humans into trees. So that's what we want to do. And our first chapter is, yeah, putting the mushroom coffin on the international market. And of course, we started in the Netherlands. We now have a factory. We can produce 500 products per month. Uh, 500 people have already been buried with this method and we're scaling up across a little bit more decentralized. How, so how are the customer reviews? They are quiet, of course, but luckily the families, so we do like customer reviews with the families, which is, yeah, how do you say it? It's pretty emotional, but pretty rewarding because it's, yeah, it's a death, of course. And most of the customers are a little bit more conscious and into sustainability. So they're pretty open-minded and easy to talk with. So they give us good, good advice, how to improve, make things better. What kind of uh, advice have we, you gotten? Now on the previous model, we had previously had a square coffin and we already know, like, of course, square doesn't make sense, but when you're a startup, you don't have much funds, like ordering like a 3D printed whole mold and plug, et cetera, was quite expensive. So we said like, Hey, make it run. They ask for better handles, better closing of the lid. And there are a lot of practical aspects to coffins, a pillow for the head, a pillow for the hands, because people lay like this, but they always put like below the elbows, there's like a little piece of something because otherwise you cannot really make it. All these little tips like are super welcoming and it also differs per country. So we're learning a lot about the death industry internationally. Uh, but coming back to your question, our goal now is to build like a blueprint factory in the Netherlands, focus on the Netherlands, get to certain revenue goals, attract extra capital to scale up, and then Europe and North America are on our, on our timeline. Amazing. I want to change the focus a little bit to just death in general. Okay. Uh, why do you think people want to preserve their bodies after they die with formaldehyde and, and wood boxes? Because it's like, you know, once you're dead, it doesn't, what do you care? Or, yeah. or is it, is it more like, because the living, the, you know, the family and the friends, like they insist on this kind of unnatural preservation. Is it, is it like a fear of death? What do, what do you think that's all about? I think first of all, it's weird indeed that you die and something that wants to decay you're trying to preserve. So preserving something that wants to decay, in my opinion, isn't, so, isn't smart. Like it's, it's against nature. So we should rather facilitate the decaying instead of trying to preserve it. From my point of view, it's, it's a combination of fear and ego because first of all, you don't, I don't think you, you people like look forward to dying. I think it changes a young person. It's natural that you don't want to die, but as you get older, what I learned from customers and other people, like you're more willing to die when you get older. So for me, that's pretty calming because I think like, okay, at some point that fear will maybe go away. And on the other hand, I think it's ego that you want to be remembered. Like I was here, this is my tombstone. And you have to show me how much you love me by going to the grave every day, not letting go, not accepting the reality that in the end, yeah, we are 
just soil, like walking soil, and we'll, we'll be soil again. Today's episode of Non-Toxic is sponsored by Fruley, a New York-based snack company making next-level trail mix with heirloom varieties of nuts, berries, and whole-roasted cacao beans. Find Fruley products at select boutiques and health food stores or order directly online. Listeners can use the code NONTOXIC, that's in all caps, for 20% off orders at fruling.co slash shop. Fruling, naturally delicious. What do you want to happen to your body when you die? And have you discussed this with, you know, family and loved ones? Yeah, my, my girlfriend is actually also the co-founder. <laughs> so we got, we got a family plan at Loop. <laughs> yeah, so that, that's pretty fun. So I, of course, want to be like in the Netherlands, there's something that's really cool. You have like a natural burial organization. And what they do, they buy up like land. They turn it sort of into a forest with a conservation nonprofit. And they make sure it's forever will be forest. And it's also a burial site. So you're sort of like in the forest. And the cool thing is they, they bury pretty shallow, which is really good for the soil health because the body decomposition goes faster because there's more oxygen. So they bury it like 80 centimeters. So that in combination with our coffin is like, yeah, how do you say it? Maintaining nature and enriching nature. And then on top, a beautiful sequoia tree. That would be cool. That's a little bit my ego speaking. My ego wants to be a sequoia tree. You want to be a sequoia. So you still want to be the biggest, <laughs> tallest tree. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Normally, I don't say the ego part, like the journal, because they're always like, oh, yeah, you want to be sequoia? Or you can be like an apple, apple tree, and then people can eat from the fruit of your body, make like an apple pie, Bob's apple pie, new company. It's funny you mention that because I go to a cemetery pretty much every day that's right near my house. Okay. That's been kind of overgrown. Okay. And I walk my dog there. A lot of people walk their dogs there. And there are a ton of blackberries, like everywhere, blackberries. Okay. And we pick the blackberries and I eat them all the time. Like it's, I, okay. love, I love doing it. And I started, I guess it was last year, we started having yeah. the blackberries. Part of me thought like, is this disrespectful? Is this okay. wrong that I'm doing this? But then I thought like, you know, what would I be when I die? Like I would want to be yeah. a blackberry. That sounds pretty good to me. So yeah, they're about to start ripening in the next week or two. So I'm looking okay. forward to that, to my cemetery blackberries. Yeah, I mean, they, they, I'm sure they, they, how do you say, they taste extra crunchy. <laughs> Well, I'm a little worried now about all the toxins. <laughs> you know that you. <laughs> yeah, that's actually that's pretty too. Yeah. <laughs> now because that you told me about this. Yeah, because what happens in most cemeteries, they you sort of pay. It's like a payment plan for the spot, and if you cannot pay it anymore, like the body is like taking out. So that's actually also another reason, like why you want to, how do you say it, not decompose the body because a a body that is dead but is still intact is worth money. Because I can bury a body that's like in a box because I can replace it. And after 10 years, it's still there. Oh, you have to pay extra. Genius. It's such a scam, but. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so it's like hard. even after you're dead, you have to pay rent. Do you believe in any kind of afterlife? Or is this, is this kind of your version of an afterlife? No, I don't know. I sort of really want to believe it. Like, I really want to, like, that there's sort of, like, an afterlife or something. Well, what do I believe? I don't know. I feel like, it's, it's, I, I think it's a pretty scary thought. That it's just, like, like you're going to sleep and it's, like, gone. <laughs> and this is, like, really not satisfying. So I try to, like, think of other things or make, like, oh, you're going to be a nice tree. It's a little bit more calming. But no, not really a big vision on it. Uh, you? I'm kind of on the same page, but I was, I was just curious if all of this thinking about death has maybe changed your outlook before you launched this coffin company, you, you were a young guy, you probably didn't think about death very often. Maybe like an old relative passes away and you go to the funeral. I suspect that you're coming face to face with it in a very different way now that this is part of your job. 
Yeah, and I think then it might not have changed my perspective of death, but it did really change my perspective of life. So I remember when the, it was the first time, like, hey, so it was really weird. And we were like an incubator at the university. We had this product and we went to like a funeral home, like, hey, can you test? We have these flyers. And like a day after they'd call me like, hey, Bob, you have to come right now because we have a customer. And I'm like, dude, we only have prototypes. And they're like, you have to deliver. And you have to come now because the body is here. And I was like, oh my God, this is happening. So I went there and it was for me the first time that I really saw like a dead body and they had like this fridge where they stored like all the dead bodies. So there were like 20 dead bodies. And for me, there was such a moment like, holy shit, we're going to die. Like everyone on earth is going to die. And I don't know. It was like, it was, I was really scared. And actually it was pretty calming in a weird sense because I was like, oh, everyone is going to die. Like nothing, it doesn't really matter. Like. It brought sort of sort of this lightness that I also experienced like talking to funeral entrepreneurs. They're like super fun and friendly and really down to earth because they are in touch with death every day. So they know the value of life because they see death every day, I guess. And that was really refreshing for me to be around death made me value life more. And that's pretty rewarding, I would say. Bob, thank you so much for speaking with me about your company Loop and your mycelium coffins. If someone in the UK or North America wants to buy a loop coffin, how can they do that? They go to loop-biotech.com or just simply Google the living coffin and they'll, they'll find a website and we already have vouchers. So you can make sure that when your time comes, you, you are secure. Okay, great. I'll put in my order shortly. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you very much. <laughs> Such an interesting conversation, Daniel. Thanks for inviting Bob on the show to, to chat with us. I love this moment in the interview where he is invited into this morgue or mortuary, wherever it was, back when he only had a prototype. And they suddenly had, had a dead body. And he had this moment where he realized we're all going to die. And in that sense, we can all do our peace for the planet in death. And that's a very positive thought, you know, in such a macabre setting. Yeah. And one of the things that came up when I was talking with him, you know, I asked him if he thought there was an afterlife of any kind. and he said, you know, the idea of planting a tree is sort of comforting, but he doesn't really think there's anything. <laughs> and, <laughs> but the tree is a metaphor in a sense. And he's like, oh, I want to be a sequoia. But that's like my ego still trying to say, like, I'm going to be the biggest, tallest tree. And, and I thought that was really funny. It's clear that he's still struggling with that. Obviously, he knows eventually there will be no more Bob. But he still like so many people wants some monument to his existence and you know bob's not really into the whole tombstone thing but he was laughing at himself wanting the biggest mightiest tree one could plant and so he, he i think he still thinks he's got a little ways to go in that regard yeah that's cool i mean a uh, come on a giant sequoia is way better than a headstone even just being mycelium right this incredible network underneath the earth i mean that's if that's an afterlife that's one hell of an afterlife because you're you're you know you're you're spreading throughout a forest and you're you're regenerating entire ecosystems so i'll vote for that i'll be a cedar tree how about that cedar tree that sounds good yeah. i think i'd like to be some sort of fruiting tree I'd, I'd like the idea of like literally providing sustenance i think that would be interesting one day, the hope is that we'll all be buried in mycelium coffins and not burning ourselves up in cremation ceremonies or burying ourselves pumped full of formaldehyde into the earth where it slowly leaches into the water. Yes, I think we can do better. We can. We can do better. Come on, people. We're all going to kick the bucket one day. Let's do better.
Thanks again, Daniel, for that conversation. That's our show for today. And that's the final show of season one of Non-Toxic. Non-Toxic is a production of Loose Thread Studios, hosted by me, Daniel Penny. And me, Andrew Lewis. Art is by Sam Creasy, music by Nathan Sharp. We'd like to thank our season one sponsor, Fruling, for all their support in helping get this show off the ground. And we'd like to thank all of you, our listeners, who've been tuning in every week for the past 10 weeks to think a little more deeply about the connections between masculinity and the many planetary crises we're experiencing. If you'd like to support the show, please sign up for our Patreon at patreon.com slash non-toxicpodcast. We'll also be doing some bonus episodes in the coming weeks, so don't forget about us. And you can keep up with the show at our Substack. Thanks again for listening, and if you like what you're hearing, don't forget to rate and review. Thanks again to everyone for tuning in, joining us this season, and please keep following along and spreading the love.